The following information provides evidence-based step-by-step guidelines on how to properly perform insertion of a supraglottic airway device, commonly referred to as SGA. This video pairs with the attached fluency. Patients who are candidates for SGA use are those who are absent of difficult airway or aspiration risks and will require general anesthesia for short procedures. SGAs can also be used as a rescue airway device and as a conduit for tracheal intubation. This video will demonstrate insertion of a supraglottic device under non-emergent conditions. Contraindications for SGA use include those with active GERD and other high aspiration risk patients such as full stomach patients, if positive pressure ventilation requiring greater than 20 centimeters of water will be necessary, in those who will require long-term mechanical ventilation and in patients who are high risk for laryngospasm. Patients with glottic or subglottic airway obstruction such as tracheomalacia or external tracheal compression have an absolute contraindication to SGA use. There is some controversy surrounding SGA use in various patient subsets. For instance, in morbidly obese patients and those who will be position prone, or if the use of neuromuscular blockers is anticipated. Without clear guidelines, use of an SGA for these patients is considered acceptable at some facilities and not others, so it's best to follow your hospital policy. This screen shows acronyms and abbreviations that will be used throughout this video. Here's a list of steps that need to be completed before bringing the patient back to the OR. These steps are very important for the patient's safety, as the decided anesthesia plan will be based on a review of the patient's chart and of their physical assessment. The airway assessment is of special importance, so the next screen provides more information on how to properly perform it. When done collectively, these assessments can be very useful tools in predicting difficulty of airway management. You'll notice the recommendations on the screen are the same as those for other methods of airway management in case tracheal intubation becomes necessary. Before beginning, discuss the importance of the airway assessment with the patient since it will determine the specific equipment needed to care for them. The LEMON mnemonic is commonly used to guide proper airway assessment. LEMON is an acronym for Look Externally, Evaluate Using the 332 Rule, Malampati Scoring, obesity or obstruction, and neck mobility. Other than key information in the patient's chart, looking externally should be the initial assessment completed to notice any overt indicators that intubation might be difficult. For instance, poor dentition or morbid obesity. Evaluating with the 332 rule is another method used to determine the likelihood of intubation success. The first three assess as if the patient is able to open their mouth enough to fit three fingers between their upper and lower incisors. If they can, there's a greater likelihood that the laryngoscope blade and SGA will also fit. The second three in this mnemonic refers to the ability to place three fingers between the anterior mandible and anterior neck, which gives a rough estimate of the submandibular space, also known as the thyroid mental distance. If the distance is less than three finger breaths, which is roughly six centimeters, submandibular space is limited, so moving the tongue into this area enough to have adequate access to the glottic opening will be difficult. If the space is greater than 9 centimeters, intubation may also be more challenging because the glottic opening can be too caudal to visualize. The two notes the ability to place two fingers between the thyroid cartilage and the base of the mandible. A rough estimate of the larynx location is obtained via this method. If two fingers cannot fit, the larynx may be too cephalid, so getting a good view of the glottic opening will likely be difficult. The Malampati score system is a tool used to determine how much space in the mouth the tongue occupies. Scoring ranges from 1 to 4. The more space the tongue occupies in the mouth, the higher the Malampati score will be. A higher score translates into a greater likelihood of difficult intubation. The next two considerations are obstruction and obesity. Obstruction refers to anything in the pharyngeal space such as a mass or trauma that may interfere with access to the glottis. The importance of obesity must not be discounted because many obese patients have redundant pharyngeal tissue that can make proper airway management difficult and cause rapid desaturation once anesthetized. The patient's neck mobility is assessed in pre-op because the sniffing position requires neck manipulation and is a very important component of successful intubation. If the patient has limited neck range of motion, 
It's critical to know why in order to avoid causing serious cervical injury and to prepare for accommodations that limit neck movement during airway management. The next focus is on mismades. Mismades is a mnemonic used as a checklist to make sure the anesthesia machine as well as all equipment and medications needed for induction will be ready for use before the patient arrives to the OR. Since Ms. Maids is discussed in greater detail during lectures, only summary information will be provided in this video. The Ms. Maids acronym begins with MACHINE. Here this refers to performing a check to assess the integrity of the ventilator portion of the machine as well as ensuring properly functioning auxiliary O2, sufficient O2 in the backup cylinder, enough potent inhalation agent, and a CO2 absorbent that's not exhausted. Next is suction. This should be turned on and ready at the head of the bed. All connections and suction functioning must be checked carefully. Just listening for the sound of suction is not a reliable indicator that it's in working order. Monitor refers to all standard monitoring equipment, including the pulse oximeter, a properly sized blood pressure cuff, EKG, end tidal CO2, and temp probe. Everything must be set up and ready for use. Alarms must be on, audible, and properly set for the patient for instance, peds versus adults. Airway includes any equipment that can be used to ensure proper ventilation. The presence of correctly sized items must be confirmed. Examples of standard equipment include a face mask, oral or nasal airways, and the most appropriately sized SGA. Typically, superglottic airway size is based on the patient's weight. However, oral pharyngeal anatomy must also be considered. Lubricant must cover the posterior aspect of the SGA and further prepared per manufacturer's recommendations. Backup airway equipment such as an AMBU bag, properly sized endotracheal tubes along with laryngoscope blades and handles, a bougie, crite kit, etc. should also be present. IV serves as a reminder to check the patient for a functioning IV prior to induction. An IV start kit must be ready as well as the choice of IV fluids. Confirm that there's an adequate amount of IV pumps present in the OR. Drugs refer to induction agents and any supportive medications such as vasoactives, anticholinergics, predetermined antibiotics, analgesics, etc. Special serves as a catch-all for any uncategorized necessities, including a warming blanket, oral gastric tubes, bis monitor, etc. Maintain universal precautions. In the OR, the provider should at least be wearing a surgical cap, mask, and gloves once hand hygiene has been performed. When the patient arrives to the OR, a timeout must be completed and the patient's ID confirmed with at least two identifiers. Appropriate monitors should be placed on the patient to obtain baseline vitals. If there are no limitations on neck mobility, place the patient into sniffing position by extending their head and flexing the neck. This position aligns the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes to optimize glottic access. Preoxygenate the patient by turning the FiO2 to 100% at 10 or more liters per minute for several minutes until the ETO2 is 90%. Perform a final pre-induction assessment of the patient and their vitals. Straps can be used to help ensure a good seal between the mask and the patient's face. If satisfied, now administer induction medications. Here's an example of commonly used perioperative medications. The next screen shows a list of commonly used perioperative medications as well, and there is a lot of content on this screen, so please feel free to pause and review. Anesthesia induction is first confirmed by apnea. Look for an absence of chest rise, mask condensation, and end tidal CO2. Then assess the eyelash reflex. If absent, tape the eyes closed to avoid a corneal abrasion. Next, ensure the ability to properly mask ventilate. Slightly close the APL, but keep the setting less than 20 to avoid gastric insufflation. Confirm proper mask ventilation by the presence of bilateral chest rise and adequate end tidal CO2. The SGA used here is an AirQ LMA. Check manufacturer's recommendations for placement details on all SGAs. When the jaws relaxed, open the patient's mouth by gently pressing on the mandible, then insert the SGA. Use the index finger to guide the SGA along the hard palate until past the tongue. If the posterior side isn't well lubricated, advancing the SGA will be difficult. 
Now add the recommended amount of air to the cuff if applicable. Connect the SGA to the circuit and proceed to confirm proper seating and seal. Confirmation methods are listed here and must be verbalized. They include equal and bilateral chest movement and breath sounds, condensation, an adequate and consistent entitled CO2 tracing that's present for greater than three to five breaths. If placement wasn't successful, recognizing the need to forego the attempt and resume mask ventilation is also key. With successful SGA placement, turn on the chosen potent inhalation agent to the appropriate MAC level, decrease fresh gas flows, and initiate mechanical ventilation with the proper ventilation mode. Secure the superglottic device with tape and use a bite block if needed. Be sure to document the procedure.